Joy Unspeakable by Martin Lloyd-Jones The Baptism and Gifts of the Holy Spirit Chapter 2 Blessed Assurance In the prologue to John's Gospel, we are told that a Christian is one who has received of God's fullness and grace upon grace. The New Testament gives us a picture and portrayal of what a Christian should be. And obviously, in that connection, nothing is more vital or important than that we should understand the doctrine of the baptism with the Holy Spirit. This is not only that we may enjoy the full blessing of the Christian salvation, but also, more urgently, because of the times in which we live. We see the Christian church in a more or less parlous condition, ineffective in a world of sin and shame, a world which is increasingly manifesting in a horrifying manner godlessness and hatred and antagonism to God. There is only one hope for such a world, and that is a revived church. So the most urgent need of the hour is revival in the Christian church, and that means revival in individual Christians. There is no such thing as the church apart from people, so we start with the personal, and through that we see how the general can be affected. In order to try to bring out this doctrine, I have suggested that perhaps the most convenient thing to do is to consider a number of general principles or propositions. We have started with the first, which is that it is clear from the teaching of both the Old Testament and the New that it is possible to be a believer and a Christian without having received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You cannot be a Christian at all without having the Holy Spirit in you. A Christian is a man who is born of the Spirit. The Spirit does the work of regeneration in him. Quote, If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. See Romans 8 verse 9. So while a Christian, by definition, is a man who has the Holy Spirit dwelling in him, that does not mean that he is baptized with the Holy Spirit. This, then, is the basic proposition and it is the aspect of the teaching that is most frequently controverted, not to say attacked. So I propose to go into this still further. If it is true to say that you cannot be a Christian without being baptized with the Spirit, that it is something that is virtually synonymous with regeneration, then the whole position is changed. That is why I am holding you with this particular general principle. Because to me, it is very vital that we should see that there is an essential distinction. That you can be regenerate, a child of God, a true believer, and still not have received the baptism with the Holy Spirit. We must substantiate this yet further. So what I propose to do now is give you certain additional reasons or arguments why it is so vital and essential for us to hold this distinction. An argument that is very often brought against the teaching which separates regeneration and the baptism of the Holy Spirit is as follows. Yes, but all of you who hold that view always seem to base it all upon the book of Acts. You must not found your doctrine on the history in Acts. That is a very dangerous thing to do. You must found your doctrine only upon the teaching of our Lord himself and upon the teaching of the epistles. Now this is frequently said and the answer, of course, is quite simple. You should never pit one section of scripture against another. You should never say that it must either be this or that. The true position is to take both Acts and the Epistles. It is characteristic of the higher critic 
egotistical attitude to put scripture against scripture, to depreciate one at the expense of the other. So there is that fundamental answer to this criticism. But furthermore, we must go beyond that and say this. Surely one of the main purposes of Acts is to show us the fulfillment of this promise concerning the baptism with the Holy Spirit. The promise of the Father. In the very first chapter of Acts, our Lord himself, after the resurrection and just before the ascension, turns to his disciples who, with their materialistic outlook, were still concerned about the restoration of the kingdom to Israel, and says, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons, but ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. See Acts 1 verse 7. In that context, Jesus quoted the statement about John the Baptist baptizing with water, but added that he would baptize with the Holy Spirit. And the remainder of Acts is just to tell us how this happened. Chapter 2 tells us how the Holy Spirit actually came, as our Lord had prophesied upon the early church, upon the hundred and twenty on the day of Pentecost, and later upon the three thousand who had believed. And it goes on to give us further examples and illustrations, as we have already seen. Now surely, this is quite basic to any doctrine of the baptism with the Holy Spirit. We are told in Acts how it happened, what its results were, how it was recognized, and its essential, vital part of the teaching. And when people come along and say, Ah, yes, but that was only at the beginning, you know, that is a very serious charge, namely that the Scripture does not apply to us. One agrees, of course, that there are exceptional times in the history of the Church, but it is always wrong to say that any teaching in Scripture has nothing to do with us, that it was exceptional. What we read in the whole of the Scripture must be applied to ourselves. It is a kind of pattern or standard or norm of what we should expect individually and in the case of the Christian Church. Let me illustrate what I mean. What is a revival of religion? It is generally agreed that the best way of defining a revival is to say that it is the Church returning to the Book of Acts, that it is a kind of repetition of Pentecost. It is the Spirit being poured out again upon the Church, and this, of course, is a very vital and essential bit of doctrine. But to go still further, and this to me is perhaps the most important point of all, there is nothing which is more fatal than to fail to see that the teaching of the epistles always presupposes the history which we have in Acts. You see, what some people are trying to do, they have done it in the past, and they are still trying to do so, is to say, Ah, well, what you have got in Acts is very exceptional. It is just the beginning of the church. The norm is what you get in the teaching of the epistles. My reply to them is quite simple. Take, for instance, the great, that great first epistle to the Corinthians. Its teaching is obviously based upon the fact that the members of the church at Corinth had been baptized with the Spirit in the way that we read of in Acts. We are sometimes told, you never find the epistles exhorting people to be baptized with the Spirit. That is perfectly right. But the answer is obvious. They are not exhorted to be baptized with the Spirit because they were already baptized with the Spirit. What is the meaning of those three chapters, 12, 13, and 14 of 1 Corinthians? The answer is that they are dealing with certain excesses which had arisen and certain misunderstandings in people who had been baptized with the Spirit. 
as I have often put it, how many churches do you know at the present time to whom you need to write 1 Corinthians? How many, how many churches are there today that need to have the teaching of 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14? And the answer is precious few. Why? Well, you see, there was a church whose members were baptized with the Spirit. And because of that, because the kind of thing that is described in Acts had happened to them, problems and difficulties had arisen. This is surely, therefore, a very important matter. It shows that this attempt to differentiate between the teaching of Acts and the epistles is completely false. The epistles were generally written to correct errors and faults in situations that had arisen. That is not only true of 1 Corinthians, but is equally true of the teaching of an epistle like that to the Galatians. Let me illustrate what I mean by a passage from a fairly recent writer on these matters. In dealing with Galatians, he says, Further, it is a fundamental principle of biblical interpretation to begin with the general, not with the special. He is illustrating the point that the history of Acts is special, but the general, the ordinary, is to be found in the epistles. So he goes on to say, If it be asked what the general teaching as distinct from the special teaching of the New Testament is regarding the reception of the Holy Spirit, we can give a plain and definite answer. We receive the Holy Spirit by hearing the gospel with faith, Galatians 3 verse 2, or more simply still, through faith, Galatians 3:14. Thereby the writer thinks he has established his case. Here he says what we should expect for ourselves. We are not in the days of Acts, which are special, but in the ordinary. Let us look, then, at the verses which he quotes from in Galatians 3. O foolish Galatians, says Paul, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth? before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? And then verse 14 reads like this, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. That we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now that writer identifies receiving the Spirit or being baptized with the Spirit with believing the Gospel, with regeneration, with becoming a Christian. And he says this is the normal way. You believe and receive the Spirit by faith. So you must not say that the baptism with the Spirit is something which is different and distinct from belief and regeneration. But in a most interesting way, he evidently fails to remember what we are told in verse 5. Now this is the kind of confusion people get into when they do not draw this distinction between baptism with the Spirit and regeneration. Look at what we find in Galatians 3 verse 5. He therefore that ministers to you the Spirit and works miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law? or by the hearing of faith. Is that the general and the normal? Quote, worketh miracles among you, end quote, and quote, ministereth to you the Spirit, end quote. This is not just a description of how people came to believe. That is not what the apostle is asking. He has, incidentally, already dealt in the first two chapters with how you believe and are justified by faith. He is now producing an additional argument. Not only, he says, do you believe, not only are you saved by faith rather than by circumcision, and so on, but let me put it to you like this. When you receive the Spirit, when the Spirit came upon you, 
when you received the baptism of the Spirit. Tell me, was that the result of keeping the works of the law, or was it this whole matter of your faith, relationship to God in Christ? And of course, the proof that that is what he is talking about is that fifth verse. Quote, He that ministers to you the Spirit and works miracles among you. End quote. Are we to say that this is the general and the ordinary and the usual? No, this church of the Galatians was baptized with and filled with the Spirit. It was a church in which miracles were being demonstrated. Of course, this was true of every single New Testament church, not only at the Corinthian church, but also that at Galatia. In other words, I am establishing my point that you really cannot truly interpret nor understand the teaching of the epistles unless you do so in the light of the history of Acts. When we come later to consider the effects of the baptism with the Spirit, we shall find that one of the main effects and results of the baptism with the Holy Spirit is to give us an unusual assurance of our salvation. And that is why, of course, I am dealing with this whole subject. The greatest need at the present time is for Christian people who are assured of their salvation. I repeat, the greatest need at the present time is for Christian people who are assured of their salvation. If we confront the world saying, well, I hope I am saved, I am not sure, but I hope, we will be depressed and we will depress others and we shall not attract. The thing that was so obvious about the New Testament Christians as seen in Acts 2 or anywhere else was their spirit of joy and of happiness and assurance, their confidence. They were so certain that they were ready to be thrown to the lions in the arena or put to death. And this has always characterized every great period of reformation and revival in the history of the church. So we are entitled to say this, if you identify the baptism with the Spirit with belief in the Lord Jesus Christ unto salvation, you are automatically saying that there is no difference between saving faith and an assurance of faith, and this is a very serious matter. Of course, people who do not draw this distinction actually say that. Let me give you a quotation again from the same writer. Quote, As a result, he says, all God's sons possess the Spirit, are led by the Spirit, and are assured by the Spirit of their sonship and of God's love, while those who do not possess the Spirit do not belong to Christ at all." End quote. Think about what he says. All God's sons possess the Spirit. That is all right, are led by the Spirit. Is that true of necessity? And are assured by the Spirit of their sonship and of God's love? Romans 8, 15 through 16 and Romans 5, verse 5. And the contrast is that those who do not possess the Spirit do not belong to Christ at all. Here then is the question that I would put to you. Is it true to say of all believers that they possess this great and full assurance of salvation. Look at Romans 8, 15 through 16. Ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Paul uses a word there which expresses this, that out of the depth of our being comes an elemental cry, Abba, or Daddy, Father. And then he goes on and says, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. It is the highest form of assurance, an absolute certainty, a glorying and a crying out of Abba, Father. We are told that this is true of every Christian. Now you see the consequence of that. Do you all possess that assurance? 
Have you got this elemental cry in you, crying out, Abba, Father? Do you know beyond any doubt or dispute or peradventure or hesitation that you are the children of God and joint heirs with Christ? Are you rejoicing in a full assurance? You see the consequence of this confusion. It is to say that large numbers of people who are regarded as Christian are not Christian at all. Now there is nothing new about this. This was something that was fought out at the end of the 16th and the beginning of the 17th centuries. Some of the early reformers, in order to counteract the false teaching of Rome, had said that you could not be a Christian unless you had assurance. There is no difference, they said, between saving faith and assurance of salvation. But on reflection, Protestant leaders came to see that this was quite wrong, and therefore in a document like the Westminster Confession of Faith, and indeed all the other great confessions, you will find that they are very careful to draw a sharp distinction between saving faith and assurance of faith, and it is very important. The Bible never says that we are saved by assurance. We are saved by faith. In other words, there are many Christian people who have come to see and to know that they are sinners, that they are under the wrath of God, that they are helpless and hopeless, and who are afraid of the judgment, who realize, furthermore, that should that should they spend the rest of their lives in a monastery trying to live a good life and to please and to satisfy God and to work up righteousness, but they will be no further on at the end than they were at the beginning. Then, just as they are in simple faith, they say, I trust myself only to the Lord Jesus Christ. They believe the truth concerning him they believe on him, and they rest on that. They are constantly having to go back and do it again. The devil attacks them, and they are terrified. They fall into sin, and they feel they are not Christians at all. But they say, quote, I have nothing but Jesus Christ and the fact that he died for me. End quote. Now the Bible says that such people are Christians, but they are Christians who are not enjoying full assurance of salvation and of faith. They are like the people to whom the Apostle John was writing in his first epistle. Quote, These things write I unto you, that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. 1 John chapter 5, verse 3. There is no question about this. There have been saints who have testified to this throughout the century, centuries, that for years, even all their lives, they believed but did not enjoy assurance. They were uncertain, unhappy, and always came back and said, I have nothing but Christ. You must not disenfranchise these people, nor say they are not Christians. But if you say that every son of God, every Christian, has full assurance by the spirit of sonship and of God's love, you are saying that these people are not Christian at all. And that is not only wrong, but it is a very cruel thing to say. Oh yes, you can be a Christian without assurance. Of course, Christians should not be in that fearful state. Sometimes it is due to psychological conditions or sometimes to wrong teaching. And it is a terrible thing, not only a wrong thing, to confuse saving faith with full assurance of faith. And you see, the moment you begin to do things like this, you get into difficulties and you begin to contradict yourself. For the writer I quoted earlier goes on to say this, Sometimes the Holy Spirit may do his distinctively new covenant work of glorifying the Lord Jesus, that is, revealing and manifesting him in such a way as to make us, then he quotes 1 Peter 1, verse 8, rejoice with unutterable and exalted joy. 
My point here is that he uses the word sometimes. Sometimes we may have visions and revelations or have some such experience as Paul had in 2 Corinthians 12, verses 1-4. through Then he adds this, I do not for a moment deny any of these things. Nevertheless, these are not the usual, general, or common purpose of God for all his people but the unusual, particular, and exceptional ministries of the Holy Spirit to some. Nor should such people who have these urge the same experiences upon others as if they were the spiritual norm. Why, then, do I emphasize this? Well, this is very interesting. I do so because what he is saying is that the position in which one rejoices with a joy unspeakable and full of glory is, quote, exceptional, unusual, particular. It is something that happens sometimes. But what does the scripture say? To whom is the Apostle Peter writing? He starts off like this. 1 Peter 1 verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered abroad through Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Is he writing there to exceptional Christians, to a body of apostles or church leaders only? Is he writing to people and saying, now you are a most unusual people. No, he is writing to ordinary church members whose names he does not even know, to, quote, strangers scattered abroad. He says, I am writing to you, and I know that this is true of you, whom having not seen, ye love, in whom, though now you see him not, Yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Peter himself makes it clear that he is not writing about something exceptional, something that sometimes happens. He is assuming it to be the norm and the normal experience of ordinary, unknown members of the Christian church. And yet, you see, because of a wrong doctrine, our writer says this is, quote, sometimes, this is exceptional. No, this is the ordinary and the usual. Very well, then, says someone, are you yourself now saying that we all of us should be able to say that we rejoice in Christ with a joy unspeakable and full of glory? My, my answer is quite simple. We all ought to be able to say that, but I do not say for a second that if you cannot say that, then you are not a Christian. What is the explanation? Well, let me repeat it again. It is that all the teaching of the epistles is based upon and presupposes the history of what happens in Acts. In other words, there is only one way you can understand the New Testament epistles, and it is this. God started the Christian church by pouring down his spirit upon them. So the New Testament church is a church that is baptized with the Spirit. And all the teaching of the New Testament assumes that. Often the church today is not like that. She often has not been anything like that in her long history. She is not like that today. But that is what she should be like. Now in the New Testament epistles, you obviously do not get exhortations to people to seek the baptism of the Spirit. Why? Because they had already had it. In exactly the same way, when there is a time of revival and the Spirit is outpoured, you do not urge this. Indeed, your problem then will be to deal with the tendencies to excesses and a certain element of riot that comes in, and you have to preach order. In other words, you will be back in the position of the New Testament church. But the Apostle Peter knew that these people, having been baptized with the Spirit, were filled with a joy unspeakable and full of glory. He, far from saying that it was exceptional, 
takes it as the standard and as the norm. Therefore, I would urge once more that there is nothing more dangerous than to start by saying you must ignore Acts and look for your teaching only in the teaching of our Lord or in the teaching of the New Testament epistles. Let me now give you a third answer to this difficulty that people seem to be in. If regeneration and the baptism of the Spirit are one and not to be differentiated, then I think we can say, from what we have already seen, that obviously the apostles had it in their power to regenerate people. You remember the story in Acts 19 of the people of, at Ephesus. The apostle expounded the truth to them. They believed it, and he baptized them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he laid his hands upon them, and they were baptized with the Spirit. If therefore you identify baptism of the Spirit with regeneration, you must say that it was the apostle who, by laying hands upon those people, regenerated them. And the same with all the other examples. Peter and John, when they went down to Samaria, must have done the same thing. But the answer, as we have already seen, is that these people were already regenerate. They had believed the gospel. In all these instances, it was afterwards, after they had been regenerated, that hands were laid upon them, after which they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. See Acts 8 and 19. But let me come to a fourth argument, which is rather interesting. There are certain sections of the Christian church who believe in what they call confirmation, and they hold what they call confirmation services. The Anglican Church in this country does it, and as do the Roman Catholic and Lutheran churches. Now where does this come from? Well, they say that it is derived from what we read in Hebrews 6 verse 2 about laying on of hands, the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands. And it is also based, they say, upon what the apostles Peter and John did in Samaria and what Paul did with those people in Ephesus. Now there are some who write like this. Confirmation is the way that the Anglican Church has chosen to receive into full membership those who have been baptized, usually in infancy, and have themselves repented and believed. They say further that it is something that God may use as a sign to certify the candidate of his God's favor. Now the answer to that is this. Confirmation is not something that the Anglican Church has, quote, chosen as a manner of receiving people into full membership. The actual history is that the Anglican Church has just continued what the Roman Catholic Church had been doing throughout the centuries. It is simply a part of the incompleteness of the Reformation of the 16th century. They continued with a number of customs, and the Puritans, of course, objected to these things. Confirmation is one of them. But what is interesting to us is this. I do not believe in confirmation, but nevertheless it is an argument which is of great value at this point. Where did confirmation ever come from? Well, I have just told you something about its origin. You see, from the beginning there was a distinction between believing and being baptized in water and receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I have shown you, and you see in the scriptures, that there was always this distinction between the two things. Paul baptized these men at Ephesus. Then, having finished that, he laid his hands upon them, and they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues. The two things are separate and distinct. Now the early church perpetuated that, and the historians are agreed in saying, I have taken considerable trouble to make quite sure of all the facts, Arthur's parentheses, that in the early days the overseer, the bishop, was the man who did the baptism with water and the laying on of hands. But as the numbers greatly increased, he found that he could not do this. So then, there was a division. The act of baptism in water was given to the parish priest, 
but the one of laying on of hands was reserved for the visit of the overseer, or, as he became known, increasingly as the bishop. Now there is a clear evidence about this in the writings of one of those great church fathers, Tertullian, who wrote at the end of the second century, and by the fourth century this was the common practice. And of course, it has continued until today. The local parson preaches and does the baptizing, but the bishop is the man who comes to do the confirming. Now I am only putting this evidence before you in order to substantiate this point, that this distinction which is so plain in the New Testament has been recognized throughout the centuries. The place where we disagree, of course, is this. We say that the bishop is not necessary in this respect, and that this is something that can happen apart from him, and so on. But that is not the material point. The point that I am establishing is that, in accordance with the teaching of the New Testament, you find that church history from the earliest times continues to show that there is this distinction between regeneration and the baptism of the Spirit. It seems to me, therefore, that those who are in the Anglican position are in real difficulties about their whole service of confirmation. Because in connection with the baptism of an infant, this is what the priest has to say. Seeing now, dearly beloved, that this child is by baptism regenerate and grafted into the body of Christ's church, let us give thanks unto Almighty God for these benefits, and so on. The same thing is repeated in the service of confirmation. Almighty and ever-living ever God, who hast vouchsafed to regenerate these thy servants by water and by the Holy Ghost, and hast given unto them forgiveness of all their sins, strengthen them, etc. It seems to me that if you identify belief or regeneration with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, there really is no point in a confirmation service. Let me come finally to what is the most important thing of all, and this is no longer quoting anybody or refuting error. This is positive assertion, the teaching of the New Testament itself. To me, the ultimate proof of this vital distinction between regeneration and the baptism of the Spirit, the teaching which says that you can be regenerate and still not baptized with the Spirit, is none other than the case of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ himself. It is interesting to notice that people who do not recognize this distinction never refer to him at all in this manner. And yet, here it is. It is so vital. It is time for us to look at the accounts of his baptism. Here he is, the eternal Son of God, more than regenerate, the Word which always was the Son of God the incarnate Son of God. Here he is now as a man in the flesh, and yet you remember what happened to him? In order to fulfill all righteousness, as he puts it to John the Baptist, he submitted to baptism. And this is what we read. Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven, which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. See Luke 3, verse 22. And you notice what happens after that. Luke chapter 4, verse 1 says, And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, it happened when the Holy Spirit came down upon him as he was there in the Jordan, full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan, and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And again, look at verse 14. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. But look again at the latter, later verses. He went into the synagogue. The book of Isaiah was handed to him. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, 
because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. See verses 17, 18, and 21. Then you have statements saying the same thing in John's gospel. Look at John 3, verse 34. For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. Then the last statement is in John 6, 27. Labor not for the meat which perishes, but for that meat which endures unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. We have already met that word sealed, sealed in Ephesians 1, 13. In whom, having believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. God the Father seal, has sealed the Son, and he sealed him at the Jordan when he sent the Holy Spirit upon him. He there received the Spirit in fullness. What for? Here is the crucial point. Our Lord was there beginning to enter on his public ministry. He had lived as a man. He had worked as a carpenter. But now, at the age of 30, he was setting out on his ministry. And here is the teaching. Because he had become a man and was living life in this world as a man, though he was still the eternal Son of God, he needed to receive the Spirit in his fullness. And God gave him the Spirit. The Spirit descended upon him. So then we read of him that, quote, Filled with the Spirit, he went in the power of the Spirit. See Luke 4, verse 14. And began to preach. He said, I have been anointed with the Spirit in order to proclaim. In other words, our Lord himself could not act as witness and as preacher and as testifier to the gospel of salvation without receiving this endowment of the Spirit. And that, I hope to be able to show you, is the purpose of the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Now you see the argument. Our Lord is eternally the Son of God, but though he was the Son of God, in order to do his work as the Messiah in the likeness of man, in the form of a servant, he needed this baptism with the Spirit. And so the Spirit came upon him, even as it came upon the disciples, and the hundred and twenty in the upper room, and upon Cornelius and his household, even as it comes upon people in every time of revival. And in the power of the Spirit he was enabled. We are told that he spoke and lived in the power of the Spirit. He died through the power of the Eternal Spirit, and rose from the dead through the power of the Spirit. Here you see, then, is established beyond any doubt or beyond any dispute or doubt whatsoever this essential distinction between regeneration being born again being a partaker of the divine nature and the baptism with the holy spirit not only do you get into difficulties if you do not recognize these distinctions but you find yourself above all in a position in which you simply cannot explain what we read of as having taken place in the case of our blessed Lord and Savior himself.